Hello and welcome to Bennett's Bike Social. My name is Simon Hargreaves, that man over there is... Martin Fitzgibbons. And welcome to what we think are the most important new bikes of 2024. Okay, so here we are in early November 2023, sandwiched between EICMA in Milan, which is the big international bike show at which most of 2024's new models will be released, yeah. and Motorcycle Live at the NEC in Birmingham, which is our first chance to go and actually see most of these bikes in the flesh. This year, we've counted something like 50 new models. I think maybe more. Maybe I think I've more. got about 59 on my list. And we know there's more to come. To come. But we know almost everything has been revealed at this point. So it's kind of a good opportunity to try and get our head around everything that's been announced and all the stuff that's been revealed or described uh, earlier in the year. Uh, yeah, head of Motorcycle Live. And new models can mean anything from just like a lick of paint and a new screen yeah. through to a complete reinvention of motorcycling. Yeah. Um, and, and some of them... there really are both examples <laughs> yes, this year yeah. for, for 24. Now, as you say, some of the bikes have already been released and have been well and truly picked over, so we're not going to spend too much time diving into those. Um, instead, I think we should focus in on the bikes that we think are the most significant to us of 2024 and hopefully they'll be significant to you too if they're not if you if we miss something out or we don't talk about something enough leave your comment down below and explain why you think we should talk more about it but because we're here we're going to do our favorite bikes and i've got four bikes that i've picked out that are the most interesting to me i've kind of got four ish okay. although that might be a little bit flexible depending <laughs> on how things go all right i think we've kind of got to start it might be a bit obvious, but we kind of got to start with what is universally, factually, un inarguably yeah. the most important, the biggest new bike of 2024. And it might feel a bit like you've already heard quite a lot about it because the bike has already been announced. It's been teased. It's been previewed. It's been reviewed. Yeah. You can already read the full review on bikesocial.co.uk. You can yeah. already watch the video on Bike Social uh, on their YouTube channel. But it is the one and only... BMW R1300 GS. I wondered if you were going to pull a gag then and say something else. You tempted, weren't you? It's got to be it, the biggest yeah, bike of has. the year, isn't it? Yeah, not just the biggest bike of this year. It's going to be the biggest bike for hope, BMW hope for the next five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years. Yeah, I mean, it could really be the bike. It could be the biggest bike of the decade. And yeah. That isn't an exaggeration to say it because because there's historical precedent. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, the scale that the GS sells on is just it's unlike any other big capacity bike in the kind of Western motorcycling world. Mm. In 2022, BMW sold 60,000 1250 GS and GS Adventures. 60,000 puts that, those two models, the 1250 GS and the GS Adventure, basically are the same size as Ducati. <laughs> yes. It is enormous. enormous. Yeah. And it's not like one year or one fluke or one trend. It's been going on for 10 years, 20 years maybe, since the first 1200 GS. Yeah. Uh, and it shows no sign of slowing down. It's kind of, it's the default. It's the trailblazer. It's the mother duck that all the other adventure bikes are kind of waddling along in its, in its slipstream. Which really puts into context the scale of the task of BMW's product planners. Because how many times, we've both done it. We've ridden the 1200 GS and then we've ridden the 1250 GS. And I'm sure we've both written and said the same thing, which is, how do you improve on this? Mm. You know, in isolation, you're riding this bike, and you're thinking, what can they do that is better? And you come up with some fantasy things like, well, it could be more powerful, it could be lighter. And you go, well, okay, but apart from that, how could it be better? And yet here we are with this, this new 1300 GS, which is a complete rewrite. Yeah, of, again, it's not an design. exaggeration to say this is properly new. Yeah. This is every single part, I think. Is, is brand new. It's brand new. But, and the interesting thing is that not only is it mechanically brand new, physically brand new, to me, there are elements of the, the marketing, the thing that attracts you to a GS, which they're also changing. And that's the thing that kind of gives me pause and makes me extremely interested in how the bike is going to actually fare in the marketplace. Because the things that make a GS a GS 
I wonder if the public, the GS owners, kind of are, they have to be in tune with what BMW think. Yeah, quite. It's and one I'm thing not for sure a, they've done that. It, is, it, it will be interesting to see. It's one thing for a, for a load of journalists to go out and, and test the bikes and yeah. write about them and, and give their opinion, give the facts, understand how the bikes work. But yes, how it lands with those with the with the bike buying public and specifically with the GS buying public. Yes. It's so critical. Yeah. And on top of that, and only you trying to do a complete wholesale reinvention of your cash cow, your biggest selling bike, the bike that pretty much the rest of the motorcycle industry looks at, you're trying to introduce a brand new bike around the world all at once. There's so much could go wrong. Yes. There is so much that could go wrong. If you're going to sell 60,000 bikes in a year, yeah. the chances of there being a hiccup with something somewhere <laughs> that's brand new, I mean, it's a far greater chance than if you're selling, you know, a niche bike in like hundreds per year. Yeah. Or you're selling a, a kind of a tweak of a previous model. If they tweak the 1250. A known quantity. A known yeah. quantity. They go, yeah, okay, well, we've done that. We've got, we know what we're doing. That one's going to be all right. But this is, a, like you say, a complete rewrite. It's, right. it's the, a the, new frame. The, it's a new engine. Like, I think pretty much every component in the engine is new. The, the style of frame, the way they make the frame, they now make the frame in-house, which they didn't used to do. Yeah, yeah, okay. I didn't they're, know that. They're all still made on the production line in Berlin. Yeah. But, yeah, there's new electronics. You know, and every time you hear... I think especially when you kind of a motorcyclist of an age, you hear new electronics, you yeah. kind of yes, hairs on the back of your neck kind of go up and you go, Well, there's another thing to go wrong. Yeah. And it mostly isn't. They were saying that about electronics in the nineteen forties and the nineteen fifties <laughs> and the nineteen sixties. There were some <laughs> early issues of bike magazine that talk about these newfangled electric starters and C D I boxes and <laughs> What's wrong with me kickstart? Yeah, quite. Yeah, so yeah. I, I, I'm not um being a doom monger. <laughs> no. That's not at all what I'm saying. No. But there's I think the GS story the 1300 GS story is not finished with the launch events and with the test rides in the UK. I think it's going to be fascinating yeah. to see how it lands with people and see where we are a year from now. I mean, I think there was something of an ugly duckling vibe with the GS. There was something quirky, something left field, something that made you as an owner, even though everybody has one, it kind of was a bit individual, a bit out there. It was a bit left field. And I'm not sure the new bike successfully captures that difference. The quirkiness. It, yes, it looks a bit too... It's too good. <laughs> no, I don't know. It, anyway. The look's an interesting discussion point because yeah. it is the first thing that everyone's brought up because the style is so radically different on that bike, aesthetically. It's so radically generic, it seems to Ooh. me. <laughs> well, I don't know. It could be. That's yeah. what I'm speculating that some people might think. But anyway. But there's also loads of other bikes throughout history that as soon as they land, mm. the first thing we all talk about is the looks. Mm. The headlight, the headlight. And in fairness, yeah. 2024 is the year of the weird headlight. It is, There'll be plenty yes. of other bikes we can come to with weird headlights. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. again, it'll be interesting to see three months from now, are we still talking about the headlight or have we all got used to it? Have uh, yeah. we all absorbed it into our collective conscious? Has the conversation moved on? Yeah, we're down, still further talking down the about bike. wonky eyes and stuff. It will be interesting. And of course, it's not the only adventure bike of 2024. Who else would be mad enough to try and launch another what well, called V twin shaft drive <laughs> radar up its nose and up its number plate yeah, yeah. adventure bike in the same year as the GS. Well, it's not a V twin, a parallel twin. I was just going to say BMW got their work cut out because they've got some F nine hundred GSs they've got to get rid of, sort they out do as actually. well. It's so not the only kind of new like, GS, is it? <laughs> they've got different <laughs> departments for each one. But yes, you're right. There is uh, Moto Guzzi. Moto Guzzi have reintroduced the name of the Stelvio. <laughs> yeah. Way. Stelvio. Which, is, as we know, is named after a rather stinky Italian cheese, as it is turns that out. Right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> is that really where the Stelvio name came from? No. no, no. <laughs> oh. It's made in the village, the Stelvio, oh, which really? I believe is the, the Italian pronunciation of a village in Italy, uh, okay. which is presumably near the Stelvio Pass. I don't right. Know, one end or the other, I guess. The world famous Stelvio Pass. The world famous Stelvio. Which I've never done. No, have you really? Actually, no. Um, no, I haven't. No, really? no. I don't double check then. We've got 50 collective years of motorcycle media history. Neither of us have done the Stelvio Pass. We never Pass. go for the obvious, though, do we? Wow. We always keep it different. So anyway, so yeah, so, so Moto Guzzi reintroduced the Stelvio. Now, you and I have both ridden the original Stelvio. Here it is. Oh, there it is. That out in Bike Magazine circa 2008. Wow. Yeah, it was it was a thing. It was Mark Guzzi's adventure bike for a little while 15 years ago. And I had a soft spot for it um, because I thought it was rather dumpy and ungainly. It had that beautiful transverse V-twin engine. Uh, it was quite a big thing. It had a 32-litre tank, 
which Did I really? think that must have been one of the later like touring or travel ones. I think it was something. the NTX it was called. Okay, which sounds like some kind of cryptocurrency, doesn't it? <laughs> but but uh, thirty-two litre tank is significant. I it's mean, how big. far can you go on that? Uh, it made how much horsepower did it make? It was make. It wasn't an awful lot, was it? One hundred and three horsepower wow. at seven thousand RPM, very low revving, a mountain of torque. It was an eleven fifty one cc, um, and yeah, it, it wasn't a rival to a GS at all. But it had a unique character all of its own, which I quite appreciated. Uh, I'm not sure you felt the same way because I'm pretty sure. When you got off riding it, I remember you kissing the tarmac <laughs> at relief at not having to ride it off road again. That's right. Do you right. remember that? Yeah, I do remember that. That was in the Peak District, and you and me taken four adventure bikes. Uh, we'd asked the guy who was our lead rider to, to just take us down some nice, easy trails. We did. That we could tackle on big someone else's big new adventure bikes on road tyres, mm. and a very, very proficient off-road rider in front of us fell off one of the bikes. He did, and I remember yeah. thinking, I'm I'm done. Like, oh, mentally, I'd checked out at that I'm point. I'm pretty sure I think he fell off the Stelvio. Oh, and I think I he think fell off the... Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah, so it was... It, to me, it felt... In 2008, the bike felt like a generation behind the GS. Mm. It had a lot of the GS's charm in that it was an air-cooled, twin-cylinder, transverse engine, shaft drive. But it felt lumpy. And it felt, it kind of rocked around, around its crank in the way that old GSs did. Yeah, yeah. So that bike kind of went away when that air-cooled engine vanished off of the I think it was a Griso engine. engine in Is the that end. what it was? I think in the end, yeah, it shared the engine with the Griso. But anyway, that's disappeared now. But this new one, the only thing that they've carried over is the Stelvio name, because yes. they associate it with their adventure bikes. But this is not a lumpy old air-cooled uh, transverse twin anymore, is it? This no, is a, all new. It's still a transverse V twin, but that's about all that's remained. So yeah. this is the Mandelo engine, effectively, which is just over a thousand cc. Um, water cooled. Water cooled now, making one hundred and thirteen horsepower, which is which is decent. It's not too chunky bad. grunt, but yeah. it's not at a GS one hundred and forty something horsepower. No, it's not. No. So, like you said, it's not a rival to, but it might be an alternative. An to. alternative, yeah, a little bit quirky. I mean, if you find the new GS a little bit too generic, too maybe, mainstream, yeah, too mainstream, yeah, you yeah. could go for this. And it has got some tech on it. It's it has got loads. It's got rider modes, and it's got traction controls, and it's got cornering ABS. It's got six axis IMU. It's got optional radars front radar. and back. Radar. How yeah. much of a surprise was that? On a Moto Guzzi? Yeah. Yeah. It was like, you know, you, not like you couldn't see it coming. <laughs> but, <laughs> and it'll uh, see you coming. Yeah. So it's front-facing radar only, I think. I think, I think there's a radar at the back as Is well. Is there a radar the at the back? whole thing's an option. And it oh, looks okay. like it's Piaggio's own software that's gone into it. So rather than buy it in from a third party, they're yeah. claiming this is part of Piaggio's own yeah, software and development. Okay. Um, really interesting. I haven't ridden the Mandelo. Have you had a chance to ride it yet? I've not. It, it's managed to slip past. It has landed really well. I think the yeah. Mandelo V100 was Bike Magazine's Bike of the Year 23, and it made Ride Magazine's uh, final six bikes for their Did, yes. um, Reader's Bike of the Year. And I think it finished quite admirably. It was third or fourth, mm. beating some you know fairly well-established mainstream Japanese bikes. So mm. the Mandelo V100 powertrain... It's certainly uh, a solid thing, very kind of modern, but without losing that kind of weird, quirky thing yeah, yeah. that you that you would want from a Guzzi. So if they can put that in a slightly adventure chassis, I think it only needs to be slightly adventure doesn't it? It's a 19-inch front wheel. Yeah. We're not, we're not going to go too far off-road with it, are we? Although it is considerably lighter than the previous model. Is it really? Yeah, the previous model was a hefty dry weight of 251 kilos. Uh, I'm looking, I'm, again, I'm thinking about the last generation, the NTX, where it was called. Yeah. Uh, and the new bike is 246 curb. Okay. So that has shed a significant that portion has of weight. Shed a fair bit of weight. And the engine, uh, according to Moto Guzzi, the engine or the project for the Stelvio was begun at the same time as the Mandelo. So they, the two progressed hand in hand simultaneously, that rather than sense. yeah, which kind of makes sense. Um, so yeah, so there we go. Oh, the one thing I want to say about it is mm. that there's two things I want to say about it actually. Oh, yeah. yeah. The first thing is, I detect the hand of Mirko Zocco, who was the designer of the uh, V85 TT. Okay. Widely acknowledged by me to be the best-looking bike of the last 20 years. <laughs> uh, but he also designed the Touareg, widely acknowledged by me not to be the best-looking bike of that month, even. You know, sure. Not, not particularly brilliant. Yeah. Um, and I detect a hint of Transalp in this. Uh, not Trans Touareg. Transalp. Touareg. Touareg. Yeah. Here's a T. Yeah, um, there is. 
I know you mentioned it, that kind of slightly underpants-shaped headlight. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, um, and it's not enough V85 TT. And I'm actually a bit disappointed that it isn't a V1000 TT. The good news, Si, is that if you are a big fan of the V85 TT, mm. is for next year, there isn't just one V85 TT. What? There's three new V85s. We're talking about licks of paint and different screens here, aren't we? We're talking about a V85 uh, Strada with cast wheels, a V85 TT, as before, spoke wheels, and a V85 TT Travel, which is a V85 TT with boxes and heated grips. Yeah, they've kind of done that before. But it's got a new engine or an updated engine, which now has variable valve timing. You get out of town. Which is a fascinating thing to introduce on a motor with push rods. Yeah, push rods and air cooling yeah. and one that sort of sells itself on being, you know, kind of fairly basic uh, yeah. but interesting. And now it's got variable valve timing. So that would be an this interesting thing to see. sounds like something they're doing to get past emissions rather than Perhaps. generate more performance. But if it secures a place for air-cooled engines in the future, I'll take I'm it. more for that. So that's yeah, good. absolutely. But, you know, okay, so there is still the V85 TT I can fall back on. But it would have been nice if it was a V100 TT. Anyway, good. So, funnily enough, though, yeah. the Stelvio is not the only new bike for next year that's named after some kind of epic topography, some kind of mountainous region. Is there an Alp? <laughs> yeah, there's also so, the... Uh, the Trans Alp. Have you heard so, of the new Triumph Peak District? <laughs> So we're moving on now to one of your choices. Yes, I'm really taken by the Royal Enfield Himalayan 452. Oh, okay. Now, this is a bike that is no secret. Yep. This has been teased ex for an excruciatingly long period by Royal Enfield. Mm -hmm. They kind of hinted at it, and then they gave you some pictures, and then they kind of gave you a bit of spec, but not too much spec. People have been out and ridden it. Journalists have already been out and tested it, but they're not allowed to talk about it until a what? certain date. That's not journalism. It's kind of madness, <laughs> but that's how it goes. Hopefully yeah. by the time this video is out, it'll all be public knowledge. But as we record this, we don't know what it's like to ride. So right. all I've got to kind of go on is the spec that was announced at the Italian bike show yep. just the other day. So the old Himalayan, which was launched uh, a few years ago, back when I was on Ride Magazine. Yeah. It gained a cult following for being this kind of solid, simple, affordable, surprisingly capable adventure bike. Mm. But it was like it was wrought out of pig iron. It was a big, heavy thing. It had a simple air-cooled 400cc single with two valves, single overhead cam, and just 24 horsepower. Yeah, it kind of fit very much in the kind of the, the perception of Royal Enfield at the top of old school Royal Enfield, if you like. Yeah. I've seen a lot of them about, though. They were very popular. They Massively were all over the place. So. And I think largely because they were ultra affordable. Yeah. I can't remember the exact price, but I'm pretty sure it was under four grand. I, it rings a bell. So they were really cheap to run. They were really cheap to buy. They were deceptively capable off-road because they did have a 21-inch front wheel, decent long travel suspension. And because where they were built for mm. is proper off-road <laughs> riding out in <laughs> India... Yeah. Um, that they could cope with British trails like it was a walk in the park. It was nothing. <laughs> so th the interesting thing now is that the 452 is completely new. Yeah. So it's a completely new 452cc, obviously, single, liquid-cooled, four valves, double overhead cam, making a fairly sprightly 39 horsepower. Mm. So a massive, like, 60-something percent increase in power over the old Himalayan. There's no tradition, yeah. you know, traditional old-school engineering going on there. This is a pretty modern spec. Yeah. It's got Leicestershire and Bruntingthorpe and uh, Royal Enfield's technology centre writ large all over. Very much. Yeah. So that's interesting because this is Royal Enfield very much coming out of the past and building contemporary bikes with contemporary levels of technology. Not to mention the electric Himalayan that they also showed a concept of at the Italian bike show yeah, recently. Yeah. I think maybe they describe it as a like a... Uh, a rolling test bed rather than a concept. But it shows that they are thinking forwards, not no. thinking, looking backwards. Not looking backwards, yeah. Um, so I think this Himalayan will be a kind of a big, it's like a, a, a demarcation in the sand between, demarcation in the sand? That doesn't make any sense. A line, a in, line the sand. in the sand. <laughs> demarcation between old school Royal Enfield who just looked at themselves in the past yeah. and new school Royal Enfield looking to the future. Because in many ways, the, this bike and this spec offers everything that kind of real off-road 
adventure riders, the kind of adventure riders who do actually want to take their adventure bike off road, mm. have been asking for for years. And this bike hasn't existed in the market. Mm. There's been smaller capacity, less powerful options like mm -hmm. the Honda CRF 250 Rally yep. that certain people were <laughs> clever enough to. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and there's the old Himalayan, and then there's the KTM 390 Adventure, which is a bit too kind of road focused. Which never people. became, was never really off road enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But so this, this a... looks properly credible off road spec. It has the 21 inch front, it has 200 mm suspension travel, it has a decent sized fuel tank, 17 litres, which is mm. plenty for an engine that probably is going to be <laughs> quite sipping frugal. It. Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot to be interested in. I think there's two things that I have question marks over with the Himalayan. Okay. One of which is the weight. Mm -hmm. It has a curb weight of 196 kilos. Okay. Which is still quite hefty. There's some there's some heft to it. Presumably it's lighter than its predecessor. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. But it's, it's probably not going to be a lot heavier. Mm. And that didn't seem to be something that stopped people. Again, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm no off-road expert. But sometimes a little bit of heft is quite comforting it in can some be. circumstances. Not yeah, all yeah. of them. No, but okay. I think that does put it on a on a par with the uh, Honda 500 adventure bike. The, right. The renamed what was the CB 500X, which we'll come to. Yeah, yeah, In yeah. a bit, but that's okay. That's that's know, a fairly sizable bike. And, and the, the other one thing? is the price because this hasn't been announced yes. as we record this. Uh, and the old Himalayan certainly sold itself on being very affordable. My suspicion is that if they're going to go to this much effort in engineering a completely new engine, a completely new platform, it's not going to be a four grand bike. Mm. It's not going to be a five grand bike because that's what the existing Himalayan cost now. Triumph's Scrambler 400 is getting on for £5,595. Yeah. Pounds. So you yeah. would think that would be one kind of threshold they'd want to have it up against. Yeah, But it could easily stretch to six. I mean, Honda's 300 Rally is now six and a half. Everything's getting more expensive. And I think... And why shouldn't Royal it, Enfield? It does. Yeah. I mean, not that it it's, shouldn't be. But it's beginning to push it into a... I was going to ask, because that is one of the dangers, is that it does start to head into a slightly different direction. Again, in a similar way, I suppose, to the R1300 GS, in that you have people... It hit a sweet spot. And when a bike hits a sweet spot for a specific set of reasons, which we talked about price and the simplicity and the, you know, the kind of... And it fit the right mould at the time. The danger is, is that when you evolve that concept... You shift your you shift from that sweet spot, and that is the danger, I suppose. Yeah, and it, it's, it's I think it's a really hard job to shift people's perception about a brand. Yeah. <clears throat> so especially something like Enfield, if if the your word association with Royal Enfield is retro and affordable, and now you're going to try and say it's modern and not expensive but priced comparable to other premium ba brands, that's quite a big job you know, They've got to do, heads. to convince yeah. people. So yeah. it'll be interesting because on paper, like I said, this should be everything that, you know, small mid-capacity adventure riders have been asking for, but it's a big break in tradition, literally, yeah. for Royal Enfield. <laughs> yeah, so. it'll be interesting to find out. And obviously um, it will sell by the squillion full around the world. And maybe, you know, we'll see what kind of quantity it sells in over here. But for me, that is definitely one of the, the bikes I have the m plenty of questions about. Do look forward to a chance to ride that at some point. Do you think that's something that could fit your lifestyle, perhaps a little bit? My lifestyle, very much, <laughs> very much. Yeah. Do you think it could fit yours? No, I don't. But no, I, can, I, I don't I, think it would fit yours. No, I don't think all. it would fit it at all. But I can think of a bike. One of my my second choice of ah. bikes to talk about definitely fits my lifestyle. Let me guess. Has it got a bit more power? A lot more power. A few more cylinders. A few more cylinders. And not made in India. It's not made in India, and it makes it's lots of comfort. I think. Tell me more. GSXS 1000 GX. Has Suzuki's keyboard only got about four letters on it? <laughs> GSX. And then they got, what, 1000 again. And they got yeah, the 1000. Yeah. And they yeah. went back to the beginning. Yeah, they? GX, okay. let's call it. Yeah. Okay, what is a GS, uh, GSX S well, 1000 GX? It's easy, Mufka, isn't it? It's, okay. a, it's a GSXS 1000 GT on stilts. Okay. No, it's a bit more than that. <laughs> it's just a little bit more. Okay. Than that. But, um, so, so effectively, this is uh, the long anticipated, fairly long anticipated answer to, say, Kawasaki's Versus or the S1000XR or the Ducati's Multistrada. It's a fairly familiar category, the tall rounder, as we call them. Uh, and Suzuki have been notably absent from that kind of uh, category. 
They've never had one, have they? They've never had one, but they have now. Wow. They've taken that GSX-S platform, so that's the well-established inline four derived once upon a time from a GSX-R 1000K5, but now oh, yeah. long evolved. Um, yeah. And then they've kept the frame, it's the same aluminium frame, and they have put it on long travel suspension, restyled it. There's a couple of significant differences. Some are practical, technical, we can talk about them, and then there's one that's a bit more aesthetic and a bit more esoteric. Um, but the main thing is it's on taller suspension, and it's got Showa semi-active suspension. Which is another first for Suzuki, I Indeed. think. Indeed, yes. Um, so, you know, we're talking about 150 horsepower, tall rounder, on semi-active suspension, uh, and it's quite sophisticated semi-active as well. I mean, Suzuki have this habit of going into detail about their technical stuff and picking out something that everybody already does but nobody talks about. Right. <laughs> and, okay. and, and I think they've done that a few times. There's some precedent for it. And with this, um, it has your standard semi-active sort of performance in that you have different modes. They're connected to the rider modes. You can have a user mode so you can set everything up individually. Um, so we're kind of familiar with that stuff already. But one of the many acronyms they have, I don't, have you got a list of their acronyms? <laughs> no, there no. There are about 10 of them. I mean, it's worth I pointing out. I joke about their keyboard, but clearly they can find, <laughs> yes. out, they can find letters when yes. they need to come up with technology. So the common denominator is they all start with S for Suzuki, but after that it could be anything. Uh, <clears throat> there is another video, by the way, of, of a, a kind of a deeper dive on the tech of the, uh, let's call it the GX, um, which has only just gone up on Bennett's YouTube channel. So somewhere else out there, there is another Can video. Can you not do that thing they do on YouTube where you point well, above your head and you say, I'll put a link up there? I've, I've tried doing that on Bennett's videos before and nothing ever appears. So, <laughs> so I'm not going to do it. But if it is, it might be up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, or link in the description. That's the other thing. So that's your good self popping down to have a look at a GX in Having the flesh. Having a good poke around at it, yes. Um, so anyway, so this, this thing that it does with the semi-active that Suzuki highlighted was that, okay, it has its normal range of semi-active modes. There's A, B, and C, which is active, basic, and C for comfort. <laughs> and, um, and then, um, and so that's your range of performance covered, if you like in terms of its damping, I guess it's damping characteristics over a certain area. Um, but it has this automatic setup where if you ride over a cattle grid or you ride over a bunch of cobblestones or something super bumpy, I mean, maybe my ride home across the fens here in Lincolnshire might qualify, I don't know. Um, it then goes into a separate mode automatically that you can't stop it doing, oh, right. uh, which is where it will kind of go, whoa, hang on, this is really bumpy. Not only does it sort of set the damping to reflect that condition, but it also affects the throttle response uh, and will roll off on the sharpness of the throttle. Oh, wow. The thinking being, I guess, is that any sudden front movement uh, at the fork, on some older iterations of uh, rubber wire throttle, you'd get some hand movement and that would ah, make okay. the ride a little bit more jerky. And so they're smoothing that off. Mm. And again, I've never heard a manufacturer specifically say that, but it wouldn't surprise me if some of them did it. And kind of, they will right. do that, you know. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. who knows? But it's a nice little touch. And it does show that this is not just some sort of like, yeah, we'll call it semi-active, but yeah, really it's a bunch of electronic screwdrivers doing their own thing, which it may well be, but it is sophisticated. It's linked to a six-axis six axis IMU. It has the full rider modes. It has the same kind of electronics that the Hayabusa had. Wow. Um, you can go in and change an awful lot of settings and do an awful lot of customising, which is good. And it still, but it still keeps that kind of basic. There aren't millions of buttons all over it. It's still got your basic kind of Suzuki four-way rocker switch and a couple of up and downs. It's got some equipment. It's got cruise control. It's got Suzuki's quick shifter, which now, like some other quick shifters, now doesn't disengage cruise control when you use it in cruise control. That's good. Um, uh, it comes with an adjustable screen. Uh, which is not a huge range of adjustment. I think, I can't remember, I think you have to unbolt it to move it, I think, as well. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, it's better than the GT, which didn't you couldn't adjust at all. So that's true. That's a step forward. Yeah. Doesn't come with heated grips. Okay. Has the option to have a centre stand, which is, again, a step forward, because the GT didn't have that option. Sure, yeah. Mm. Uh, do you know, I don't, I don't mind so much that it doesn't come with heated grips and it doesn't come with a centre stand, because I think... Not all riders want heated grips. Not all riders ride in conditions that require heated grips. And centre stand, again, it's your point. choice to have it. The yeah. reason I kind of will give them that leeway is that the price is so competitive yes. that you can forgive it being a couple of hundred quid here and a couple of hundred quid there if you want those pieces. Because this bike is £14,499. It is, yeah. Now, I don't mean to be dismissed. Like, I'm not saying £14,000 is cheap. Don't get me wrong. But... 
you mentioned probably its two closest rivals would yeah. be Kawasaki's Versus 1000 SE. I think that's the semi, no, semi-active would be SA, but this SE <laughs> version is the semi-active one. That yeah. starts at £15,700. Yep. And BMW's S1000XR, I don't know what the price of the new updated model is, but the 23 version started at £15,700 before oh. you started adding all the gadgets. Yeah, semi-active is another £1,000 on top of that. So, so you're, you're talking... at a bike that's over a thousand pounds less expensive than the kind of base comparable specs of any of its rivals. And I think if you're doing that, I don't mind if it's a couple hundred quid for a center stand we or can... a couple hundred quid for heated grips. We can kind of let it's that slide. It's kind of got bit. stuff that you can uh, you can fit afterwards. If you want to fit Oxford heated grips to it, you can. Yes. Um, if you, you don't know... mother about a center stand because you've got a paddock stand at home, do that. Yeah. yeah. There is a sl- there's a couple of quirks. It doesn't. You can't. Suzuki won't support the fitment of a top box. But okay. They're still at the stage where I think Yamaha went through this stage with the Tracer 900, but not the Tracer 9 GT. Tracer 9 GT, top box, pannier's not a problem. Tracer 900, I think, was they didn't want you to fit a top box. And I think for a while the FJR 1300 went through the Kawasaki similar sort of thing. Kawasaki 1000SX. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not the only bike that's... No, but, but that is w- one little point. But the other really thing that's interesting is that although its price appears to be really competitive... Having got up close to it, there is definitely an increase in Suzuki build quality, finish quality. Oh, wow. Perception. And I'm not talking about how long it'll last because it might rot in winter just like everything else does. I just mean that thing when you open the garage door and look at the bike, there are areas that it still is very much kind of like it is what it is. But there are some areas that you can look at and genuinely appreciate. And something I kind of only noticed afterwards when I was re-watching the video that we made the little Suzuki logo embedded in the mirrors. I've mm-hmm. not seen that before. I mean, no. maybe it's happened, but that's quite nice. The paint, the green model, the, the, uh, the green paint looks great. It looks really good. Um, so, yeah, so the component quality, and, you know, it's got gold forks and all the rest of it. Uh, it just steps up. The Suzuki clocks look really nice. Uh, the cockpit, again, it's not a kind of BMW's metal flake level of gorgeous finish. Oh, it's pretty good. It, you don't look at it and go, well, that's a Suzuki because it's not quite as well finished. It's, it looks a bit budget. does not look budget. Well, that's promising. I don't think. The other thing that's really promising is that it doesn't look like it's been retuned or detuned from GT spec. This 150 is horsepower is pushing some serious ponies. Yep. Whereas the Versus 1000 is detuned from the 1000SX to 120-ish horsepower. 120, which I always forget. I yeah. always kind of assume that the Versus engine makes as much horsepower as the as the as the SX as the um, Z1000 used to. But yeah, it's um, that's yeah, that's it's, a it's, kind of it's signalling proper. some serious sporty intent. So for me, in my head, the Versus kind of sits at this end of the spectrum, which is very comfortable, big seats, massive carrying capacity, great wind protection, but kind of quite a big thing. Mm-hmm. And at this end of the spectrum is the BMW S1000XR, which is basically a super naked but upright and mm. it's real aggressive it's real angry it's real top endy mm-hmm. and it's perhaps not as cozy and comforting and cosseting over distance as the versus mm. in my head the gx is going to fit somewhere in between that and it sounds like it's kind of nearer the bm end than the kawasaki end yeah uh, cheaper than both on price as you say but in terms of quality and performance it's definitely up there with bmw standard which is which is interesting to see how it gets on. I think it's going to be a big hit for them. I think it's going to sell really well. Um, but uh, it's all well good though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just as a briefly, it's not the only new Suzuki because there is also the news of the GSX-8R. Ah, yes. Which has just been revealed as well at ICMA. So, which you know, we kind of knew it was coming, and it's not hard to work out that it's a GSX-8S with some lower bars. Not radical clip-ons, but just a little bit lower and a full fairing. But apart from that, I think it's pretty much the same platform. I could be mistaken. Um, yeah. Same same detachable subframe, same frame, same engine, same power output, which is a little bit... It's 80-ish yeah. horsepower. Now, I've ridden the 8S around Snetterton, which, granted, has a very long straight, um, but you did want a little bit more at the top end, yeah. perhaps. So... I think if you're you know, thinking of taking your GSX 8R to a track day, choose your track. That's what <laughs> I would suggest. Track carefully. There, it's not impossible that Suzuki could have 
found a little bit more power from that engine <clears throat> for a uh, sporting purpose, but it's interesting that they didn't. Yeah. It's an interesting choice. It's also part of a kind of a new generation of super sport bikes that I've noticed is another little trend of the year. There is, yeah, yeah. So between things like, obviously established in the market already is the Aprilia RS660, parallel twin, Kawasaki Ninja 650, Yamaha R7, um, the Honda CBR650R, which gets some slight updates for the year, we'll come to mm -hmm. in a bit. There's also the newly reintroduced Honda CBR600RR. Yes. There's a reintroduced Kawasaki ZX6R. Super Sport 600's back again. Super Sport, well, you can't call them Super Sport 600's now, <laughs> no, because now they're we? Super Sport anything. Yeah, yeah. But they're bikes with that kind of 80 to 100-ish horsepower output. Mm of varying different engine configurations. Now, we're still waiting on Triumph <laughs> to officially reveal the Daytona 660 that is widely speculated to yeah. arrive, yeah. Um, as well as KTM possibly with an RC and possibly Yamaha with an R9. None of those things look like they're on the horizon anytime soon, but it does, it does kind of strike an interesting tone that the 600 sports bike class that completely vanished from our shores a few years ago is kind of... Sneaking back in in different iterations. The bars are slightly higher. The engines are slightly more mid-rangey. The prices are slightly lower. But it's also interesting that the number of angles that the manufacturers are coming at it from in terms of its capacity. Yeah. It's like almost like they don't know who the customer is. They're just hoping there is one out there somewhere. And are they going to be wanting a 400? Or are they going to want a full-fat 600? How much do they want to spend on it? How much technology do they want on it? It's like they're fishing yeah. to find out who's available to buy these bikes. It is. It's kind of like the start. Of, it's like the whole cycle of super sports has gone all the way back to kind of the mid-80s, where yeah. they're kind of all creeping up from 550s and whatever yeah. else. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see how successful the GSX 8R. Not a GSX-R, yeah. but a GSX 8R. 8R. Yeah, interesting to see how that goes down. Yeah. And, of course, Kawasaki are a leading player in that sort of, like, jostle for position with the... ZX4 They've got RR. Indeed, I guess you could look at that as another version, another variant on the Super Sport theme, couldn't you? Because the ZX4 RR makes about 80 horsepower, mm -hmm. which is pretty close to what Suzuki's GSX 8R <laughs> is making with almost twice the, <laughs> twice capacity, the capacity and half the cylinders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's interesting. But for me, that isn't, and I know loads of people watching this will think the ZX4 RR has to be one of the most exciting, evocative bikes of the year. I don't think it's even the most exciting bike in Kawasaki's range. Okay. Ooh. Certainly not the most technically interesting. Controversial. New opinion. bike in Kawasaki's <laughs> range. Far be it for me to be controversial. All what right, is exciting it? might be a push. Okay. But technically interesting, I think, is beyond okay. doubt. How about which bike in Kawasaki's range do they claim the best 0 to 64? <laughs> Yeah. It must be a sports bike, surely. Well, perhaps, maybe, possibly, okay. terms and conditions apply. <laughs> the bike that I'm most interested by that Kawasaki have only just announced mm. is the uh, Z7 Hybrid. Yeah, so the Z7 Hybrid uh, follows hot on the heels of the Ninja 7 Hybrid, which has already been ridden by journalists. I think you can read the review on bikesocial.co.uk. Um, the Z7 is the naked version, kind of makes sense. We're used to Kawasaki having ninjas, their fully fair yeah. bikes, and Zs as their nakeds. I think it's interesting because it tells us that Kawasaki are kind of seriously committing to hybridization as a thing. Now, that is, to be clear, where you have not just your 451cc parallel to an engine, but you also have an electric motor kind of sat on the back of the cases. I think it's 12 horsepower. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's able to aid and abet the petrol engine when required. So potentially at low speeds, you can run the bike just on the electric motor. Mm -hmm. You could accelerate away from a standing start on the quiet, cool electric motor, and then the petrol kicks in. Um, and then when you get up to speed, the petrol could, I guess, potentially be recharging the battery that yeah. feeds the electric motor. Yeah, yeah. There's no plug-in business. You don't have to find a charging station or plug it in overnight at home. I think it's helpful if we think of this, uh, us traditional petrol heads, think of this as a new technology, a bit like a supercharger stroke, turbocharger stroke, <laughs> nitrous oxide. This is a <laughs> yeah. thing bolted onto a petrol engine that makes it, that go, makes it go faster. faster. 
What's you know? Not only that, but it's like you can turn the engine off and just run it on the supercharger alone yeah. if you want to get around without any petrol. You know, it's kind yeah, of yeah. it's like it's got lots of little advantages. Yeah, Kawasaki used to putting things on the back of the engine, aren't they? <laughs> exactly. With the H2 and the yes. yeah. So that's kind of what this is. So this suggests that the idea of hybridizing a bike isn't going to be a flash in the pan. That yeah. they are committing seriously to it, and I just think the spec's really interesting. It's not massively powerful. I think the peak output of the engine and the motor together is less than 70 horsepower. Mm -hmm. um, and the bike is probably a little on the chunky side for a middleweight bike. It's certainly long. Yeah. It looks it's long. It's very long, which I guess is they have to fit the battery in behind the motor, behind the engine. A lot of stuff to get And in create there. the cooling around it. So there's yeah. a lot to package. So I think... But I think that's part of the reason I'm really interested in it, is that it's it's a difficult thing to do. Yeah. And Kawasaki have taken that challenge on, and not just in a concept or one way we'll do it or one day we'll do it. Yeah. But we're doing it now, and yeah. we're doing it in two bikes. Yeah. And we're going to make this happen in production quantities, and it's going to be in your dealership the start of next year. That's fascinating. It is fascinating, and it. it it's also fascinating from a sort of a manufacturer point of view when you think of the kind of the DNA of Japanese manufacturers in the things that they tend to, the behaviours that they show and repeat. Um, and so you can think of, for example, I don't know, uh, Yamaha make zany motorbikes. They are zany, some of them. They're crazy. They're wacky. You know, other manufacturers, maybe Honda, you don't tend to associate zany with Honda. You tend to associate a certain level of a sheen of professionalism. Yeah, mature they, and sensible yes, exactly. and well -engineered. Yes, they can go fast, but yeah. they're also quite grown up. Uh, and then you look at Kawasaki, and they are all about top speed Power. and performance. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. you think of all those classic Kawasakis. But there is an adventurous streak to them in terms of design because they made a supercharged road bike, Yeah, several of them. So know. right now, in the 2024 Kawasaki range, there are multiple supercharged bike options for kind of big bananas sports bike, sports tourer and naked. Yeah. There's options for electric, sports and naked, and there's also options for hybrid, sports and naked. And they're talking about having hydrogen. They're still spent a fair chunk of their speech at Eichmer talking about their future hydrogen projects, yeah. which I'm massively <laughs> cynical about, but we'll wait and see. You've got Good to take luck. their word. Let's yeah. see what they do. Yeah. So they are a company that really is not just embracing kind of their, again, it's a bit like Royal Enfield earlier, not just obsessed with the past, but, but looking to the future as well. Yeah. So I'm really interested. And you talk about straight line speed and performance and Kawasaki's heritage with GPZ 900s and ZX 10s. According to them, their hybrid bikes are faster off a line than a ZX-10, or as fast off the line as a ZX-10. As you said at the beginning, I'm, I'm sure terms and conditions apply. <laughs> terms and conditions apply. <laughs> and the other terms and conditions that does apply to all of this is the price, uh, which again, not yet announced, and yeah. it really could be stick some dice in a Yahtzee shaker and <laughs> see what numbers come out, because it's going to be a lot of money for a 451cc bike. There's a lot yeah. of tech that they need to... Get the money back on the R and D, I guess. Mm. I mean, the bikes are going to cost because you've got a 1.4 kilowatt hour battery in the back of it. You've got an electric motor, the extra research, the extra yeah. metal in the swing arm. They and it's it. kind of clear that the chassis spec is on the simpler end of things. Let's let's trim the budget there. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, but it's like you say, it's good. Kawasaki are casting their net wide. Yes, they are looking at things and they are quite adventurous. And they're quite happy to take a punt on something that they probably know will not be massively popular with traditional motorcyclists. Mm. For example, it doesn't have a clutch lever. Mm. It doesn't have a gearbox mm. pedal. Everything's an automated clutch and an automated gearbox. You can, I think, in some modes, change with your fingers, but these are not words that traditionally no. get red-blooded, Old school are bikers. We, are we getting dangerously close to saying that Kawasaki are the most woke Japanese manufacturer <laughs> out there? Because it sounds like it. Because oh, I can I tell know. you, I can tell you for sure, <clears throat> conservative with a small C has got Honda written all over it. Possibly. Possibly. <laughs> Possibly. Well, let's let's look at their Eichma range, their 2024 model range. It's all very family values, isn't see it? See if we can apply <laughs> yeah. that term. <laughs> Because it strikes me. So, yeah, so we have everything from a bit of a paint job on some bikes, a bit of a tweak here and there. We're thinking Africa Twins, 
we had a little bit of a remodeling and a, a sort of restyling. We can think of things like uh, what have they done that to the CB six CBR six fifties. Um, get a little bit more than they get a sort of a fireblaze style retweak with the styling, but the, I think they also get the E clutch. Well, yeah, so that will be the debut of Honda's E clutch okay. on the six fifties. Which is an interesting technology in that its is, own right. I'll give them that. Yeah. That is a little bit woke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that would be interesting. But yeah, there's revamps. There's revamps to an awful lot of bikes in their range. Yeah. And quite how vamp the revamp is <laughs> remains to be seen. But I think the Africa Twins, both standard and adventure sports, have been updated yeah, in some yeah. small way. Yeah, yeah. The 500s. Yeah. The solid, trusty 500s. Well, the, C, the 500s go a bit weird, don't they? Because the, the CB500X now becomes the NX500. Yes. I think, um, which is the, sort of the bringing back the NX name, which I think was the Dominator was the last bike it, with the NX. That's right, Which yeah. is a bit strange. But that kind of achieves its own little, it's almost like its own little model now, rather than being attached to this triumvirate of bikes. The CBR500, as we say, becomes a little bit Fireblade-esque, I think, and has a In few extra bits styling, and bobs. Yeah. yeah um, and the CB500 becomes the CB500 Hornet. Yes. Which is interesting because it shows that Honda are taking their Hornet name quite seriously. And the one genuinely new bike at the moment in their 2024 range is the CB1000 Hornet. Yes. Uh, so it is the top end of the Hornet name. It's a 2017 Fireblade engine, making quite a lot of horsepower. Okay. 147 brake is what Honda claims. So in that sense, it is a bit like the 750 Hornet, which was just a parallel twin, but it's making 90 brake, which is like, come on, that's what the CBR600 was making. So that's pretty good going. Mm -hmm. 147 in the 1000 is good. But for me personally, that's kind of where the, the fascination with this bike sort of ends because the rest of it is fairly predictable. It has fully adjustable show of suspension at the front, and I think it's preload and rebound, uh, and rebound at the back. Um, so that's okay, that's good. It has a steel frame. Steel twin spar frame. Which is a bit... Mm, it's a bit... Mm, it's also yeah. a big break in tradition from their big Hornets and CB1000s because they've had these kind of spine frames, haven't they? They have, yes. Going back yeah. for years and years and years. So if you go back to the last big capacity Hornet, that was your favourite of mine, the CB900F. Which was an interesting machine because that did have some aluminium and it had aluminium swing arm, which actually maybe the new Hornet does as well. But um, but the thing about it was that the, CBR, uh, the CB600 Hornet was such an iconic bike and it was uh, beloved of all kinds, a whole range of bikers. There was a race series for them, some nutcases bought them, some fairly conventional motorcyclists bought them. They need to suit an awful lot of people. But the CB900 Hornet was kind of a bit anonymous. You thought sort of went, oh, it's got a Fireblade engine, the old Fireblade motor, yeah. that's going to be special. And actually, it was a bit of a grey bike. It didn't really... It was good, but it wasn't Yeah, I liked it. I liked it, but I know what you I mean. It. it didn't quite have the sort of head case. Yeah. It didn't sort of have the glimmer in its eye that the 600 had. Again, it's almost a case of marketing rather than the bike itself. It didn't hit anybody's sweet spot. It didn't fit anywhere. And then what's kind of interesting, in 2008, that became the CB1000R, which was this styled in Italy... Um, single-sided swing arm. Again, same premise. It still had a backbone frame and a fireblade engine. Yeah, but yeah. Honda went to great lengths because I did the press launch of that CB1000R and Honda went to massive lengths to say, this is not a Hornet. Yeah. Don't think about this as a Hornet. And you went, well, it looks like a Hornet and that's the layouts of a Hornet. They were but... going through their, this is not a Hornet phase because they did that with the 600, didn't they? When the, the, the CB, what was, what was it called? CB650? CB 650, 650 yeah, yeah, it came out. This yeah. is not a Hornet. <laughs> this is not a Hornet. Funny how things come full circle. In yeah. So I guess this is an evolution. We went from CB1000R with the pointy styling and then we went to CB1000R with the round headlight, the Neo, Neo Sports Cafe. Cafe thing. Yeah, yeah. And now all of those are kind of being left behind. And now we've got this new Hornet, CB1000, not R, mm. with, yeah, Fireblade engine, next generation Fireblade engine. Yeah. Different frame, twin-sided swing arm. So it's kind of lost that single-sided European flair. Yeah. It's sort of... I, mean, I don't want to shoot these things down before we've had a chance to actually ride them because it could be the most enjoyable, I'm dynamic, sure dynamically, wonderful thing. Sure, dynamically, it's going to be great. But visually, you do kind of your eyes are kind of hunting for things to get excited about. Aren't yeah, they? yeah, yeah. And the pricing of that bike is going to be really interesting because 
I think, I, we don't know for sure, but the press release made a point of saying it's designed in Japan, which very much hints that it's not assembled in Japan, which, as we know, is not a bearing on the quality of the bike, but it does speak to the cost, in, the cost concerns and the cost positioning of the bike. I yeah, that, it'll be interesting to, to see where it is made, because if it is made outside of Japan, I think that would be the biggest capacity Honda made outside of Japan. If they Apart from the gold ring in the States. Good point, good point. <laughs> I love a fact. Yeah, uh, good yeah. point. Do they still make them in the States? No, they don't. They used to. They, they used to. to. Yes. They used to. Yeah. I wondered whether that designed in Japan wasn't a shot across the bows of whoever drew the CB1000R, <laughs> which was designed in Italy, <laughs> ah, yes. and the Neo yeah, yeah. Sports thing, which... I remember now. Where did that come from? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm not sure about the styling necessarily fitting in with the Hornet family thing as well. The headlight, again, 2024 year of the funny headlights, who am I to talk? But <laughs> yeah. it's, it's not massively similar to the CB500 Hornet or the CB750 Hornet. Yeah. They are kind of brothers with different mothers there going on, aren't they? It's... Yeah, but you, you do worry about a family when you the only commonality a DNA is the family name. <laughs> yeah, you'd want a DNA thing. test, wouldn't you? Yeah, interesting. <laughs> yes. And so there are other Hondas. It's not, you know, there is a tweaked Fireblade. Interestingly, only the SP version of the Fireblade for sale in the UK next year. Is it? Yeah, which is the really expensive one. So last year, 23 and a half grand. This year, fair to guess, it will be more expensive. There's a bit, um, I think there's different wings and Honda talk about having shifted the power slightly down the revs. I think peaks are 500 RPM lower, but it does feel a little bit like ma making you know, tiny tweaks to the recipe. I was looking at the kind of the tiny tweaks, the iterative tweaks to the engine. And it's one of those ones where if you list all the changes in engineering terms, it's quite a lot of stuff going on. And I just had flashbacks for 20 years when that kind of engine change would have been poured over in detail. It would have been a six-page special. Would, in the yeah. Movie, yeah. And you'd have talked about how they arrived at this engineering miracle where they'd made it <laughs> rev harder a little bit. They've or, updated the intake ports, airbox funnels, and exhaust midsection revised to deliver extra mid-range. <laughs> exactly, yeah. We'd have had tech diagrams explaining it all. Yeah. And, and now here we are. It's a niche of a niche of a niche. It is. Kind of going, I think the most really? technically interesting thing on that Fireblade is it's got split throttle bodies, which means it's a ride-by-wire system, but there's two motors. So one motor drives the throttle bodies on cylinders one and two. Okay. One motor drives the throttle bodies on cylinders three and four. Now, the press blurb explains how this is a benefit to a road rider in terms of things like engine braking control, but... My sort of cynical suspicion is that that is entirely a thing put in to homologate those throttle bodies for World Superbikes <laughs> to allow this really sophisticated kind of mid-corner traction control thing they do yeah, yeah, where the bikes yeah. run on two cylinders or run differently on two cylinders from the other. And I think a rule came in a couple of years ago where you have to have that feature on your road bike if you want to have it on your race bike. So I think sometimes manufacturers tell us we're having things that we want to have when they've got a race team over in that corner going, yeah, yeah we want that, that's for us, and thanks. You know what, the irony is sometimes that idea of the race team saying, yeah, we want this, is actually the thing that drives the marketing of those changes. I can think of many GSX-R thousands that had geometry changes because Max Biaggi <laughs> said so, you know, that sure. kind of thing, back in the 2000s. Yeah. Um, good, and excellent. We probably okay. shouldn't gloss over the return of the CBR600. Um, we did skate over that a bit, We didn't did we? a little bit. Yeah. It's kind of mild to moderate news. First, it is. Or last seen in the in a UK showroom in 2017. But never discontinued worldwide. I don't think so. I think it's been bubbling along in Japan. Sort of while stocks last <laughs> situation sort of thing. There's definitely an update a couple of years ago when it did get these kind of wings and ride by wire and traction control and some electronics and stuff. Mm. And so it seems like apparently there's now enough demand within the European market for them to ship a small quantity over to us. So it'd be really interesting to see where that's priced, yeah. given the context of all the other various super sport class machines that are available. I mean, anecdotally, you 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 know you can't buy a, a used super sport six hundred, probably a good one for love nor money. They're really desirable. They're all over the you know they the, the values are holding. So so maybe Honda have been looking at the used bike values. I think and we thinking, can we can get in there. We can sell a few more. Or again, have they just reintroduced it because they need to homologate them if they want to go racing? racing. Who knows? We Quite shall see. Possibly. But I mean, I suppose 
putting an old Fireblade engine in a naked bike, that's one thing you could do with an old <laughs> superbike engine, isn't it? Yeah, that is one thing. What else? Another thing you could do with an old superbike engine yeah. would be to chop it in half yeah. and fit it in a supermoto. Oh, now, why would you want to do that? <laughs> why would you want to do that? You might want to do that because you're Ducati and you've just announced the Hypermotard 698. Hypermotard 698. is probably not up your street now, is it, Si? Singles? <laughs> Singles. Definitely not really Ditch your pumps, company. mate. Clearing oh. ditches. That's all oh, is that all they're good for? No, it's not. <laughs> I've ridden a KTM, so I know that the singles can do a bit more than that. Well, I think you're not the only one who's ridden a KTM because this looks like Ducati <laughs> properly going head to head with KTM in their <laughs> arena. Yeah. So uh, this apparently is a new engine, 659 cc single, based on half a Panigale 1299 engine. Okay. Now you can do the sums. Yeah. Panigale 1299 was actually 1285cc. Half of that is 642 and a half. So clearly there's a bit more stroke put on that engine to get out to 659cc. But it is a whacking great piston. Mm -hmm. 116 mil. I think that might be the biggest piston in motorcycling. Wow. I'm not sure, but it's a big thing. And because it hasn't the rocket got three of those, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> not quite. No. I think because it's relatively short stroke, it revs as well. This might be the first large capacity single that goes over ten thousand RPM. That's a lot of revs for a That's lot a of metal. A lot of revs that for a single stuff. piston, isn't it? So obviously yeah. it's got twin balancers. The output is quite impressive. It's seventy six horsepower. Now obviously if it was half a Panigale. 1299, it would be over 100 horsepower. but So there's clearly a slightly milder state of tune going on with it. But on top of that really interesting idea of taking half a Super Quadro engine and yeah. turning it into a mono, there's also massive electronic spec, including something I never thought a manufacturer would put on a road bike or okay. allow to be put on a road bike. So in with all the electronics, there is a thing called slide by brake, which is electronically regulated backing it in. Yeah. So it will kind of tweak the ABS, I guess, in line with the IMU to kind of inform whether the bike is out of line or in line. Mm. But most impressive is there will be an optional Ducati performance software called Wheelie Assist. Wheelie Assist? This is not anti-wheelie. No. This is Wheelie Assist, wheelie. which is, quote, <laughs> and I quote directly from the press kit, to, quote, perform and maintain a prolonged wheelie. Wow. Okay. Now, I'll tell you why I want to ride this. It's because I want to be the first journalist in the world to say, this is my Wheelie Assist right here. <laughs> <laughs> this is that Wheelie Assist getting right in the way. I'm yeah, to turn yeah. it off, all of that it's sort of... Spoiling all my fun. The way we did with ABS, and then yeah. we did with Traction Control, and then we did with all the other gadgets that turn up. Got to turn it off, mate. <laughs> Got to turn it off. And it's really ballsy. It shows Ducati really mixing things up. They now have single V-twin and V4 in their range. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that long ago that all Ducati did was V-twins. Yeah, yeah. It shows them massively taking on KTM head to head. There is very much that whiff, isn't there, of a, of a kind of like, oh yeah, one upmanship going on. Yeah, I mean, what are they going to do next? Launch a motocross bike, <laughs> steal oh. one of KTM's <laughs> top motocross riders, and <laughs> sign into their new motocross project. It could happen. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> the only slight downside with this Hypermotard 698 is that it ain't cheap. Okay, I, I, well, that's. I'm not surprised, but go on. <laughs> Probably shouldn't be a surprise. How cheap is it? 11,161 sterlings. Which Do you know there's for an awful, a 660 a, single? Yeah, granted, it's very specialist. Very specialist. I'm not surprised Ducati seemed to make a habit of going after the premium customer. And it is quite an exclusive thing. Mm. You, you were talking about, what, the biggest piston with the highest revs? I think so, it's, yeah. It's, you know, when it comes to extremeness... This is pretty extreme. It's pretty extreme for a specific like, niche of a niche of a niche, though, again. <laughs> yeah, so... it has that Venn diagram of people who want a Ducati with 76 horsepower, with one cylinder, with a load of gadgets, and have 11 and a half I don't want anybody out there to feel sorry for motorcycle journalists. But when we, we make a habit of putting ourselves in the shoes of other people who own bikes and thinking, is this what they want? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, it's never been harder because there's so <laughs> many different varieties now. There is. Wasn't it easy when it was all just like sports 600s, sports thousands, maybe some tourers, that's it. I but mean, now, look at what we've got. I know. And uh, you say um, 
that it's quite it is quite expensive bike for that but I think it's actually the cheapest of all Ducati's <laughs> new bikes this year. Oh, right. I've oh, yeah, m- misplaced yeah. my list, but off the top of my head, there's yeah. a new Monster 30th anniversary, there's a new Multistrada GT, there's yeah. a new Desert X Rally, which is £19,000, there's a new Multistrada V4 RS, which is £30,000. Uh, 30 30 pounds. It goes on. I mean, it goes on, it does. Yeah. But it does show the breadth. Uh, of Ducati now. When you look at that, there's something off-road, there's something kind of road, there's something street bike, they have a new Panigale 30th anniversary thing, uh, and now they have a single-cylinder supermoto. Maybe, it's, you know, it's a bit like BMW. They're going they're going for that perfect garage, aren't they? It's like, if you're going to fill your garage with bikes, you rich person. Have one of each. Have of one these. of each from our range. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Now, I think that's a really good-looking bike. I thought the Hypermotard 1100, which again comes from that kind of 2007, 2008 kind of era, was Ducati's best-looking bike since the 916. Oh, okay. I wasn't quite as much of a fan of it to ride. It was a no. bit sort of styling over function. Yeah, very much it so. sort of felt a bit... I mean, a great engine, but never quite sure what to do with it when you got to a corner. Yeah, So exactly. the best thing to do with a Hypermotard back then was to park it up and stand back and go, oh, that's a good looking bike. <laughs> Every corner. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. And I think the 698 is a good-looking bike, but I'm going to guess it's not... Ah. Your favourite looking bike it's of 2024. Not my favourite looking bike of 2024. And that would be? Oh, Yamaha. <laughs> I want to have your babies. <laughs> it's the XSR 900 GP. Wow. I mean, how many nostalgic boxes does that tick? I mean, all of them. All of them. You know, it's in, it's in, it's in strangely Marlboro colours. Yeah. I didn't think we were allowed to do that anymore. You're not allowed to mention that word. <laughs> we, not, we can't say the Marlboro, the M word. <laughs> yeah. But it wouldn't surprise me if you, you know, had a few stickers on it. Crikey. Or maybe they sold it as an official extra pack. So, you know, it does look like some, something Wayne Rainey would have been writing. Yes. No question, which is a great start. It's it based on a fantastic package. Uh, no secret, it's probably my favourite engine of the last five, six, seven, maybe ten years. That triple is great. 890cc... 117 horsepower, wedged with mid-range, still got top end, sounds fantastic. Yeah. I was riding one yesterday. What tra- were you riding? I was riding a Tracer 9 GT. Oh, yeah. And I left my earplugs out for some of the ride because the sound of it, when you yeah. gun it through the mid-range, fantastic quick shifter. Um, the chassis is really good now. Uh, with Since they sort of revamped it in 2021, 20, 22, um, the, the, the chassis dynamic is superb. Man, that thing just, it's got a nice weave and a nice wiggle when you want it to. You can really feel the traction when that mid-range kicks in. And the idea of transferring all that from a tracer, but we had the XSR 900, which was lovely in its Sonauto Gaulois blue, you know, kind of there's a lot of Christian Sauron going on there. That ticked a few nostalgia boxes, but it didn't have a fairing. No. You know, come on, put a fairing. They've put a fairing on it. Fairing. And the, yeah, and the flat bars. Clip on now we've got clip ons that don't look too radical. This isn't like the old, do you remember the Arbath, that special edition? Oh, yes, the Fiat kind of. Yeah, yeah, which had a, we had, I think it had the FJR, XJR 1300. Ace bars that were right uh, down by the yeah. wheel spindles. Ridiculous things. This doesn't look as radical as that. No. It has some nice switch gear. The cockpit. Wow, it's got split pins in the fairing stays. Is it really? Yeah. I hadn't spotted that. Well, I hope that's production because right. that looks amazing too. Oh, yes. Yeah, big split pins action going on oh, wow. for quick release. Perfect. Oh, yeah, for when you, all those times you need to quick release. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I spotted that they're not. it's not just a cosmetic thing as well. They've actually altered the frame. The frame is different. Yeah, it's got yeah, an yeah. aluminium steering stem or something, yeah, which I think absolutely. it says the first time they've put that on that frame. There's a bit of talk about, you know, kind of getting the right balance for, for the frame stiffness in certain areas. So I think the whole frame has been looked at um, because they do acknowledge, I guess, the sporting intent of the bike. Mm. Um, but, yeah, so... so and from a looks point of view, it does it for me. There's a shot of it in the marketing bump of it on a concrete plinth in someone's garage, and you, like it was a classic. Right. And you okay. sort of look at it and go, do you know what? I, yeah. I could do that. I'm not actually going to ride it. I'm just going to buy it and put it in my garage and look at it. So, it's going to be a car park uh, attention gatherer, isn't it? It's going to be a hand grenade of attention. The first person who rides an XSR 900 GP into a gathering of motorcyclists <laughs> is going to not be able to get off the bike and not be yeah. able to get out of that gathering. Yeah. Do you think it's better with the half fairing or with the optional racer kit? 
racer pack, I think it's called, which gives the fairing lowers. Yeah, I think the kit comes first. Leave I love that. When I saw that after, I was like, wow, that that's finished. Yeah. That's it. That is really good. Because really, without that, the engine's not a looker and you just get a bunch of mangly headers at the front and it's kind of a bit like spaghetti going on. No, cover that bit up as well. Yeah. And then you're getting really into sort of like, what was it second generation FZR, FZ 750R, I think it was, territory. Um, yeah, beautiful looking thing. Really excited to ride it. And uh, yeah, that, that, that ticks, my, ticks my box all right. I'm surprised and interested that this bike has arrived before an R9. Yes. yes. Because I think most people, think it many people... shadows it? I would be surprised if Yamaha are going to go to the trouble of altering the frame just for that one bike. Mm. I think, if anything, you can now take those clip-ons and that steering stem and apply it to another bike, maybe with more modern styling, further down the line. Okay. I'm told by my insiders that that is not happening for 2024 right okay so it could be a 25 bike or perhaps yamaha have decided that going retro is the way to do sports bikes nowadays <laughs> ah, it's not a bad move i mean they're not the only ones who think that going retro is a good way to sell <laughs> sports bikes nowadays are they because uh this kind of comes i think it's another theme of 2024 is looking back to the 80s and 90s yeah you know between let's try and list them all there's the ducati panigale 30th 916 anniversary thing there's the ducati monster 30th anniversary thing kawasaki have 40th anniversary ninja asterisk terms and conditions apply because it was never called a ninja over here but it was in america <laughs> yeah uh, they've got h1 paint schemes on the zx10 zx6 zx4 they've got gpz 900 colors on the thousand sx yeah. 650 yeah mv augusta of all people are getting in on the action with a cigarette Sponsored. With a uh, Kajiva elephant yeah, homage yeah. called the LXP Orioli. Yeah, yeah. So everyone's getting in on this looking back at the 80s and 90s thing, which. Yeah. Looking backwards to go forwards. Looking backwards to go forwards. I find it fascinating because some of that stuff slightly, slightly predates me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> not, not biologically, but, but mentally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think it also makes me realize that if you're looking back to something that's happened in the. Late 80s. Uh, late, uh, the 80s, yeah, 80s. You're going back 40, 40 years. years. Yeah. And I, it makes me think, well, when did manufacturers start looking back so far? Yeah. The earliest that I can think someone looked back 40 years was when Triumph released the Bonneville in 2000. 2000. And that was looking back at the 1960s. So if you want to feel really old, <laughs> just bear in mind <laughs> oh. that all the XSR 900 GPs, all the Panigale 30ths, all the ZX... Uh, paint schemes yeah. are basically like having a Bonneville in the year 2000. Do you remember when they came out and we all looked at the old bloke buying a Bonneville and went, he wants to go back in time 40 years, he Bless does. Bless him. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he does. That's all of us now. Good grief. Thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, Hope you sleep well tonight. <laughs> God, what we, you know, thank, thank the Lord for KTM who aren't looking backwards. KTM cannot be accused of going back that far in time. Oh, yeah, they are looking back a bit, aren't they? They are looking back a little bit. <laughs> and they can't either be accused of building safe, familiar bike styling. Okay. Because probably, the, I mean, the 1300 GS headlight was controversial. Yep. I think the Honda might be a bit unusual. But the headlight on the KTM 990 Duke is not of this planet. Right. <laughs> it okay. looks like... I don't know, something insectoid, something alien, something off of a horror film. So they're still pushing it's that like kind of fangs. insectoid <laughs> thing for the fangs. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing looking They're doubling thing. down on that look. Yeah, they are. They think, you think some of our previous bikes have been aggressive and insectoid. Yeah. Wait till you see this thing. Yeah. What it is, is it's not safe and family friendly. No. It's very aggressive. It's very putting their KTM brand values up front, isn't it? Mm. It's like pointing you in the face. Do you think this is a good looking bike or not? <laughs> No, not really. No. But KTM are really bold with it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it belies an awful lot of other changes going on underneath. Yeah. Because it feels like only five minutes ago they had a 790 Duke. Yeah. And then an 890 Duke. And then various 890 R's, GP's, SMT's, Adventures, Adventure R's, Adventure Rallies. Well, forget all of that because now we've got a brand new platform called the 990. Yeah. Which... Again, for gents of a certain age, is a throwback to 
the proper original KTM 990. 990, yes. Again, funny how things go full circle. Don't they? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So this may or may not be an expansion or a re-engineering of the current 890 platform. Mm. The engine actually isn't a 990. It's a 947cc parallel to him. Makes 121 horsepower, 76 pound foot of torque. Um, mm. Looks to have a similar styled tubular steel frame, but KTM say it's all new. Mm -hmm. The swing arm looks new. The engine externally does actually look quite new. The sight glass and the oil dipstick have both moved in, in where they are. Um, yeah. And they say, they being KTM, say they want to move the perception of size away from the entry level Duke models and closer to that of the Super Duke R. Right. And other litre class competitors. Okay. So I think, on the one hand, it's easy to be a bit cynical and say, why are they chucking perfectly good engine systems in the bin or engine configurations in the yeah. bin to bring a new one in? I think previously they had their 790 middleweight and their 1290 Super Duke. Yeah. I think what they're trying to do now is keep the 790 because that's now still in the range, made by CF Moto at yep. a very affordable price tag. Yeah, yeah. And their big Super Duke, which may or may not be becoming a 1390 in a couple of weeks, I think they're trying to have a three-tier system rather than just a two-tier two -tier. system. So I think if you look at it on that regard, it does make sense. Mm -hmm. And I think also you can see them trying to target buyers of things like Yamaha MT-09s, MT-09 SPs, those kind of nearly but not quite litre bike yeah. um, engine configuration. So I think there is kind of, it does make sense. I understand why they're doing it. Not entirely sold on the styling just yet, but no. it does make sense. And the reason I'm most excited to ride it, the reason I'm really excited, not necessarily to look at it, but to ride it, yeah. is because when you compare it spec for spec with this original Super Duke, the power is almost the same. It's actually slightly higher on the new 990 Duke than yeah. it was on the old Super Duke. The torque is more on the new bike. The weight is the same. I mean, do you remember riding these the first time around and just thinking how much fun they were? How yes. wild they were? Yeah, 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 yeah. Now, if you could have the same thing in a perhaps a slightly more compact package, yeah, maybe... I just uh, think yeah, it was so much fun. Yeah. Uh, KTM have, have tried to have a three-tier system before, haven't they? When you think of things like the 1290, I think was that at the same time there was the 1050 and then that became there the 1090, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, and it was sort of trying to, to, to fill those gaps. And now instead of downsizing a V-twin, they've upsized the parallel, parallel twin. twin. Yeah. You know. My problem is, is, I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of, of parallel twins overall. I think they are not a default exciting engine configuration. And... That's not just because you can't tune them, because obviously you can, but even the manufacturers can't decide how to build them properly. Because you've got a 360 and you've got a 180, then you've got a, a 270 degree crank. And then whatever KTM have got. Yeah, and whatever the, that is. And then yeah. how do you balance them? Do you balance them with twin balancers or do you use a dummy con rod underneath or do you put balances in the cams? <laughs> yeah. No one can quite figure it out. And, and they are not a thrilling naturally thrilling engine configuration in terms of their character and their performance. Um, what they are is cheap to put together. Probably, yeah. I mean, certainly, yeah. Yeah. So, so you know, and, and, and the other problem I've got with KTM's range is the speed at which, the rapidity at which they turn over their models. And I just kind of get a bit, not confused. Well, I do get confused about it because for, <laughs> for a while all? I was convinced <laughs> that they would bring out a 990 SMT and I couldn't work out why they'd only just brought out an 890 SMT. And I was thinking, well, why are they doing that? But you know what? Next year they probably will. Well, 2017 was the 790. Yeah. 2020 was the 890. 2024 is the 990. Yeah. So if every three or four years it goes up by 100cc, then by the end of this decade we'll be at what? 1290? Yeah. And <laughs> that'll be the middleweight. <laughs> Madness, absolute madness. Now, the other thing, speaking of engine inflation, there is also a price inflation that goes with it. Right. This is going to be £12,999 before you tick your, uh, what do they call it, the electronic options package that they'll give you for free for a few hundred miles and then mm. say you can't have it. Demo mode. Yeah. So before you tick the demo mode box, you've already spent £13,000, which... Doesn't sound like middleweight money, and we have to stop with this middleweight terminology because this is not a middleweight in any way, shape, or form. 
It's pretty much the same money, actually, as the old Super Duke was if you scale up for nearly 20 years of inflation. I think the old bike was 8,300 and something, and this is now 13 grand, which is kind of there or thereabouts. Um, but look, yeah, I know what you're saying about parallel twins. They haven't always been the most fun engine configuration. I have no doubt that KTM will make this the most fun parallel twin there has ever been, which might not sell an awful lot to you, <laughs> but I think would be, uh, I'm really looking forward to riding it. Excellent. I think it'll be exciting. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, I think that just about wraps up, I think, our assessment of what's coming in 2024. Now, oh, no, we could go on. We go, we we've don't got start loads wrapping more. it up. Don't start asking them to like and subscribe and all that rubbish. We haven't even talked about the Triumph 400s, the Aprilia RS 450. We've barely talked about Triumph at all. About, there's so much more coming out in there's 2024. There's so much more, but honestly, I think we've talked enough. And I think if you think what, that we've missed something out, Please put it in the comments down below and tell us why we should have talked about it and tell us what you think your favourite bikes of 2024 are going to be. Yeah, and um, if you were watching this before Motorcycle Live, then we might well see you at Motorcycle Live pouring over some of these bikes on the, uh, on the stands. And I think at this stage of the video, I think it's the best point to say, please get your insurance from Bennett's if you live in the UK. Please become a Bike Social member if you can. Um, if you're not a Bike Social member yet and you are going to uh, Motorcycle Live, you can pop over to the Bennett's Bike Social stand where I believe they're going to be offering half price Bike Social membership. Wow, okay, that's a good so deal. So if you're not already a member, it's down from £60 a year to £30 a year and that opens up hundreds of exclusive offers, deals, bargains, competitions, experiences, VIP, British Superbike, Fandangos. It's really well worth being a member. I'm a member, I use my discounts all the time so wholeheartedly endorse doing that but the other thing i think it's really important to say is that if you have enjoyed any of us driveling on you can listen to us on a podcast called front end chatter can you you can which has been going for 10 years no way it has yes and so you can get that from all your itunes and your spotify's and your usual podcast supplies but you can also and you should download it from bennett's website which is bikesocial.co.uk that's the chicken. Good. Right. And after all of that, Ooh. I think all that remains for us to say is thank, thank you. you very much. Please watching. like, subscribe, click the bell. What else are you supposed to do? I'm not as au fait with all this YouTube stuff. We're done. Stuff. We're done. We're is out now. Yeah, Can we're I out. go now? Yeah, we're done. Off. If I need um, a wee, where do I do a wee? Just, Is it yeah, in the yeah. ferns? Yeah. <laughs> it's just out here. Okay, in the bin. In, in the bin. You'll see the loo there. And